gentlemen. Okay. Last two weeks ago, excuse me, two weeks ago I asked you a question. And I'll see if I can remember what that question was. I'm not asking you to remember it, I gotta remember it myself. There is a term that I've heard only within the Adventist church. I'm sure other churches may have used this. But it's a term that is the science of salvation. That there was something that took place at the life and death of Jesus Christ that was more than just a man given his life. That what took place through Jesus allowed you and I as sinners to be reconciled with God. Actually, it was God reconciling us to Himself. We don't reconcile ourselves with God, but God reconciles Himself to us. So my question was, is what was it that actually took place that brought reconciliation? What is the science of salvation? And I gave you guys two weeks to think about it. Did anybody actually think about it? It's okay. I thought about it. Love. Love? That's good. Listen. Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy. Whose abundant mercy? God's. God's. According to God's abundant mercy, He has begotten us again unto a what? A lively or a living hope. What's the difference between hope and a living hope? I hope that I have enough money in my bank account to, when you guys cash this check that I just gave you, <laughs> that it'll cover it. I hope that it happens. What's the difference between that hope and this living hope which comes from God the Father? Living hope is an action. Living hope is an action. It's not just, well, I hope it's there. It is something that is material, right? It's real. It's in the physical. It's a living hope. He has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible. That's what we went over the last time. An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. How is your reward reserved in heaven? Because it's kept by the power of God, because you are kept by the power of God. Amen. So this ties into what we talked about in our Sabbath school class today. How are you saved? Alright, we went through a whole Sabbath school class, and that was the title of the Sabbath school class. How are we saved? Now let me ask you a question here. Before you answer that question, that's the good answer. Okay? The Bible sees us as good people, moral people, just people. How does the Bible view humanity? Desperately wicked. Desperately wicked that we are a fallen and sinful race. That in and of ourselves we have no hope of standing before a holy God and coming out justified. Right? This lively or living hope from the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what will allow a fallen race to stand in front of a holy God and come out the other end justified. Ricky? Actually, without the incarnation, that would be first. Right. It, we're, I'm leading up to that. This has to do with the entire science of salvation. Okay? Something took place at the cross. Most of you know what it was, but you only have a half an idea of what took place. And you have to have a full idea to understand why salvation and what God did is so important. Yes? God, God has been on trial before the universe. and He was justified at the cross. And they saw that, that sin would actually destroy God. Uh, it justified him for the universe and and the angels that hadn't committed sin because we're told that they were they were still and had doubts even though they hadn't sinned 
until the cross. When it justified God, what what did it actually show? What did it show to them? If God was seen to be just, what did it show or prove to them? Right. That God's not arbitrary. Okay? That what God has ruled, what God has requested, and what God has required is right. Right? And that there is nothing of darkness in him. God is not evil, nor is he the author of evil. But God is holy, just, <coughs> and good. Isn't that what his law is stated as being? Yes. Now do you understand why we keep telling you that the law is just an expression of God's character? Yeah. Right? Yes. Now. Yes, uh, we're going to mention also where Lucifer's claim in heaven was the law was unjust. So God had to come down in the form of Jesus and show to the world that God's law was just and that he could keep it and we could also. And that's where he, that's what he conquered on the cross also. So there were certain things that took place at the cross. But is that the only place where this whole thing of salvation played out in the life of Jesus? Was it just at the cross? Before the foundation of the very good. Okay? So verse 5 of 1 Peter. That who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What is the last time? The end of the world. The end of the age? Now, how many of you believe that you're living in the end of time? So wouldn't this text talk directly to us? Yes. What is it that we're waiting for? Are we not waiting for Jesus Christ to be revealed? His second coming, right? That we have an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away and is reserved for us in heaven. And it is reserved for those who will be alive in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye be in heaviness. Is that what that word says? Yeah. Donald? Yeah. Heaviness through manifold temptations. What does that mean? <laughs> you gotta come up closer too, huh? <laughs> okay. So I like that. I don't have to read it with my glasses. What does it mean to be in heaviness through manifold temptations? That you're grieved. Grieve for the trials that you're going to go yes, through. Yes, for a season you grieve because you're going through trials and sufferings. Okay? The book of 1 Peter was written for an audience of people suffering persecution. Okay? It had a direct impact on the people in Peter's day, but it also has had an impact on everybody that lives from that point all the way to the end. But there's a special message here for those who will be living in the last time. Do you understand? This is a, a, a big word. It took me years to learn how to say it. Learning from Elder Victor's in the house. That Abbas, no. No, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't learn how to say it right after thinking about it. I can say it up here. You can't do this. No, I'm not it. No, stop it. Guys know what a telescope is? Okay. <laughs> When you have prophecy, when you have uh, these letters written in the Bible, you need to realize apotelismatic principle. There you go. See? It's a big word. Don't ask me to spell it. The apotelismatic principle. You hear that word telescope in there? What does a telescope do? See things far away and bring it up closer, right? So you need, guys need to realize this. When you're dealing with the books in the Bible, they had a specific purpose for the people that they were written to. When John wrote the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos, was it just for the people living in the end of time? No, because no, he had seven letters to seven churches. And those seven churches got a specific meaning out of those letters. But you need to realize that each one of those churches represented a time period as well. So it also went from that time into the future. Apotelismatic principle. Okay? So Peter writes the same principle. He wrote this for the church people who were suffering persecution in his day, 
but also for those who would come later on and suffer persecution and all the way to the end for those living in the end of time. Now you raised your hand, you believe that's you, right? You're living in the last days. So if for a season you be in heaviness through temptations or trials, understand that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold What's more precious than gold? The trial? Now read what it says, because sometimes it gets to be confusing. What is more precious than gold? The trial of your faith? Or your faith? The way it's written sounds like it's the trial of your faith, right? Understand he's writing this to people who are going to and are suffering persecution. And when you suffer persecution, you're always going to wonder, where is God at in this? Am I by myself? Why am I going through this? Does God still love me? Does He still even know I'm here? Does He care? Wherein you greatly rejoice, though, for now for a season, if need be, you be in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. When? At the second coming of Christ. Right? This has a special meaning for us today. So if you are facing manifold temptations, trials, realize that that trial is working something that's more precious than gold, and that gold perishes, but your faith will not. Right? Okay. Whom having not seen, this is Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you will rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, what's the end of your faith? The salvation of your soul. And that happens at the second coming, right? So all of this is telling you that God is not here to take away your trials. I've got bad news for you. If that's what you were hoping for, it's not going to happen. Because God will use trials to take the dross out of your faith. What's dross when it comes to gold or silver? Debris, impurity, junk, right? Now, how many of you carry no junk? Raise your hand. Okay, ain't nobody raising their hand here. Okay, now for better English. We all carry impurities in our walk with Christ, right? This is why salvation is given two specific terms. The first term is justification, and the second term is sanctification. Justification happens when? Uh, in Adventist terms, it's the work of a moment. Justification, work of a moment. That when you accept Christ as your personal Savior, you are justified. What does the word justified mean? Just as though you've never seen that's a good that's a good definition of that. Okay? Squared away. What's that right? Squared away. Squared away, I like that too. Listen. The Bible tells you that there is a record of everything that you not only do, but everything that you say and everything that you think. Right? And that everything that you've done in this life, everything that you've thought, all of your motives is recorded. And at some point, that's going to come up before a holy God. Does that scare you? <laughs> now, I know you're honest, and I know that worries you, right? And when I, I never worried about this before I came to Adventist. <laughs> that was squared away. <laughs> and I became an Adventist and heard about this, this, this judgment thing. And uh, then I became worried. 
And I realized that my worry was actually overshadowing my joy. And I had no assurance. And I realized that my understanding of this had to be wrong because God, through His Word, tells me that I can know, know, not N O, but K N O W, I can know that I have salvation. Amen. Right? <laughs> so, if everything you do, everything you say, everything you think is logged down, what's the purpose of that? If God doesn't forget anything, why does it need to be written it's down? It's not for Him. You understand? You understand what He says? Why is that? It's not for Him. It's not for God. What do you think you're going to be doing for that thousand year millennium? We're looking through the books. <coughs> So all this stuff is written down for whose benefit? All of them. Ours. Should I throw out this question? Does that include, Say that. Does that include like when he forgives us our sins as if they never were? Or I mean, are those still on that? Listen, that's a good question. That is a good question. Listen, if it says everything is written down that you ever done, and that in the investigative judgment your name comes up. And boom, everything you've done is right there. You have to give an account for it. But how can you give an account if you're not standing there? Because it's an investigative judgment. Woo. There you go. There's the answer. You got that. That's something you guys have to think about because you're good evidence. You have to think these things are true. I went through this with my Sabbath school class. Okay? But listen, she asked the question. Now, if, you've, if you are a believer in Christ... And the Bible says that He would separate you from your sins as far as the east is from the west, and that He'll put your sins in the very depths of the ocean. Right? right? So, are they still logged down in the book? No. No. I don't think so. No. Yeah. But the Bible also tells you that if a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, then all of his righteousness is... Yes. So then everything is still back there. So what do you guys think? If we Stay love him and confess our sins, he writes them in the sand. So this, the answer to that question is, do you really think there's actually a book that it's written down in? The technology that we have today, do you really think there's a book now? Think about it. If you live, if you live back in their day, even in Ellen Wright's day, you had no idea what a computer was then yes, it would make sense that it's written in a book. If God knows everything before it happens and can see something that has happened 10,000 years ago as it happened today, and it's not written down for His benefit, when you're talking about God's view of your sins, what happens to them when you become a Christian, is that for God, they are done away with. That when you are in Christ, they're separated from you as far as the east is from the west. But here, for those that are good Baptists that believe in once saved, always saved, when you take that text that you find in the Old Testament that says, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, then all of his righteousness will be remembered no more. Okay? It also says that if a wicked man turns away from his wickedness, right. then his wickedness will be remembered no more. Praise the Lord. You're talking about two things here. God's memory and what's written down in these books. God doesn't remember your sins anymore. And they are wiped clean. So that when you stand before God, if you are found in Christ, you have a clean slate. And when God looks at you, who does he see? Jesus. He sees Jesus, okay? And you'll never have to face your sins ever again. This is the question when I asked you. I, I, I threw it out there. And I asked this in my Sabbath school class. I want you guys to think about this. Think about this hard. We are always told that you'll stand before God and give an account for everything you've done in this body. When does that actually happen? If Jesus comes back the second time, he tells you his reward is with him. With him. So, you're not going to stand before God then to give an account if you're a Christian, right? right. Adventists tell you there's a pre-Advent judgment. Correct. That the pre-Advent judgment is so that he can know who 
is uh, truly his, so that when he comes back, he's got his reward with him. But if that's the case, you're still not going to stand before God and give an account because you're here on this earth. And isn't this what you're worried about, Linda, is that your name's going to come up while you're still alive in the books of heaven and God's going to look at your case and it's going to be decided right then? When do you actually get, get a chance to stand before God and give an account for everything you've done in this body? After a thousand years? No, that's not just what you've done in May. You got, have you guys ever thought about this? Most of us will just look at the same way you are looking at it. Be guys and I don't know. <laughs> what do you think, Ricky? I think that, uh, you know, the Bible says that the judgment was given to the Son. Okay. And, then it's, and then it also says later on in John where it says that Jesus does not judge us. And then we and we got to look. Well, so who does judge us? You go to uh, 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 John three eighteen, and you can find out who judges you. Who judges you? You judge us. You you actually yeah by your unbelief or unbelief. Right. Now what we're talking about here is two separate things. You're talking about judgment <coughs> unto salvation. Yeah, you're correct. And then the second one is judgment unto reward. When you stand in front of God and give an account for everything you have done, the book of Revelation tells you that the wicked, that happens right before the lake of fire comes down. When every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord, right? Okay. Salvation. When does salvation actually happen for the believer? There you go, the moment of belief, right? Okay. Salvation happens the moment of belief. So if salvation happens at the moment of belief, then your judgment has taken place. Then. Yes. Right? Because in that judgment, it has now, something has taken place. And this is the whole science of salvation. That when you believe on Jesus Christ, the moment you believe, the Bible says that righteousness is imputed. You know what that word imputed means? Put on. Given to. Uh, if you think about it as a bank account, it's been deposited into your accounts. Righteousness has been given to you. Do you deserve this righteousness? No. Have you done anything for this righteousness? No. Right? Okay. When you believe, transaction occurs, your sinful nature, all the sins that you've committed, has been washed clean in the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Is that all there is to it? No. This is what I'm saying, that most Adventists understand this, most Christians understand this aspect of it, but there's a whole other aspect. That's justification. That you are made right with God. God has reconciled you to Himself. So that your past, your present, all the sins are washed away, separated as far as the east is from the west, and put into the very depths of the ocean. That you never have to see, hear, or think about those again. Is that right? When it comes to standing before God. But now you're called to live a life of holiness. Is that right? Yeah. Are Christians called to continue to live a life of sin after they're given their hearts to Jesus Christ? No, no, no. Everything I read from cover to cover of the Bible tells me that God requires one thing. Perfect holiness. Now here's the question that was brought up in the Sabbath school class that I brought it up. God desired to live in the very presence of the people of Israel. Is that right? Yes. Were those people righteous? No. Were they sin free? No. How can you have a holy God living in the midst of a sinful people without Him breaking out and consuming them? 
Oh, you guys got quiet. You shake your heads a lot. Yeah. Yeah, have, special have you thought about this? <laughs> what did Balaam say when he looked over all Israel? He said they were perfect. They were perfect because of God Himself. When Moses approached the burning bush, what did the voice say to him before he took another step? Is Moses the only one that's ever heard that being said to him? No. No. Right? It is God who is holy. And when God creates whatever he creates, he creates holy and just and good. But because of Adam and Eve's choice, they were deceived, right? And because of that deception and because they sinned, they lost their holiness. Why do you think they made fig leaves for themselves? Why did they finally, re why, why five minutes before that didn't they know they were naked? Sin. Sin. Open their eyes. Knowledge of good and evil. Okay. Spirit. Mel? You know, the fig leaves represent our own righteousness. And they try to cover up their sin with their own righteousness. Very good. Why didn't they know that they were naked five minutes before that? Because they wasn't. That's right. You understand? Because before they sinned, they were perfect. They could stand in the very presence of God and see Him face to face. The Bible tells you in Genesis that in the cool of the evening, who would come down and talk to them? Okay? But when they sinned, God came down at the same point in time, right? What did God say? Where are you? And what was Adam's answer? He was afraid. I was afraid because we were naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? How did they know they were naked? Because something happened when they sinned. There was... Let's see if I can explain this. There was a transaction that occurred. Okay? They were holy. They were beings that were beings of light. Right? Where did they get this light from? Did it come from themselves? No, it came from God. Why? Because they were created in the image of God. And when they sinned, they lost that light. That image was marred. A transaction took place. They traded in their light and they received darkness. Amen. They traded in their holiness, and they received corruption. They traded in their life, and they received death. You understand? And that's where we're at today. So at the cross, and through the incarnation, something took place, another transaction. 